good day, and thank you for checking out the Sportsline podcast here on CHCH. I'm Bubba O'Neill. As we like to say in these parts, if you can make it in Hamilton, Halton, and Niagara, you can make it anywhere. And it's those teams, athletes, executives, and broadcasters who we love to spotlight on the Sportsline podcast. Well, from the small community of North Adams, Massachusetts, John Salavanis took his playing experience as an offensive lineman and built a football resume as a coach on both sides of the border that covers leagues like the NCAA and JCAA, the World League of American Football and the Canadian Football League. As a great cup winning coach with the Tiger Cats, legends maintain Coach Sal built the best offensive line unit and never swore at us even when we deserved it. For years as an analyst on radio and to this day, the Hamilton community know him as the coach on the Tiger Cats audio network. And straight up, this individual is the most knowledgeable football mind that I have ever met and folks i'm really happy to have john salavanis with us here on the sports line podcast amazing thank you so much for joining us well bubba you're more than welcome and and uh, you know you're building me up to something that i may not be <laughs> <laughs> but i do appreciate the fact that uh, you asked me to come and talk with you about the tie cats well because you know football you know the cfl as well as anyone like i said i i, I certainly mean mean what i when i when i said but i mean i've learned so much from you and we had mike morreale here a couple of weeks ago and he i mean as a player for a dozen years said he still as a broadcaster learned more about the game than he might have even known as a player yeah well i, I think it was uh it was mickey mantle when he went into the uh uh, broadcast booth after he retired and he said uh, and I paraphrase it somehow he said I didn't know how simple the game was mm -hmm. until I came here and tried to describe it to other people well coach how are you I mean it's the off season right now I mean we've gone through that long season Ty Cats lose in the Eastern semifinal in the in 2023 and uh, during the off season do you just shut it down from football Basically, I get away from it, uh, not completely, but uh, enough that, uh, Bob, I, I, you know, I keep an eye on uh, what's going on and try to uh, stay abreast of the new rules and changes, et cetera. But mostly I, I just uh, let it play out mm -hmm. because uh, you really don't know. Every year, every team is a different team. Mm -hmm. Every coaching staff is a different coaching staff. So you start from uh, ground zero mm -hmm. every year. And, and that's what the Ticats are doing now uh, with uh, Scott Milanovic as their head coach. Are you surprised at the, at the changes that happened? I mean, we're talking about Coach O, no longer Coach O, now being the president and Scott coming in. And I think we knew that his role was going to increase, especially when he became more so the offensive uh, coordinator. Did you expect that that move there? And, of course, the moving in of a new general manager, a solo general manager as well? You know, uh, this goes back to uh, Bob Young and Scott Mitchell. I mean, they've teamed up and they've put together uh, what I would regard as a corporation. And, and when you look at it from top to bottom, uh, you have the, the uh, president uh, or, let's say, the caretaker, number one mm -hmm. then you have the president which is scott mitchell ceo and then you start moving down and widening out and so i'm not surprised that they're able to do it the with that uh way of doing business mm -hmm. uh i am surprised that oh went out as early as he did i i thought he he's a good coach and he and he had time uh as a young man to, to continue coaching. But I I, uh, I think when they brought Milanovic in, mm -hmm. it, you go back to when they brought June Jones in. Right. June Jones behind Ken Austin. They have their next head coach here on the or in the organization uh, so they don't have to go to the outside, mm -hmm. bring in an outside person. That uh, Scott knows the system now, mm -hmm. understands their corporate structure, and will fit right into uh, what's going on. And he comes into a team, though, and let's, we cannot deny this. I mean, the Tiger Cats, that long, long break between Grey Cups and where we are at present day, reaching 25 years. Is Scott ready for that kind of pressure? I mean, the Hamilton football fan, they demand. I mean, they're getting to the point where they're demanding wins. They demand to be in the postseason. And that with that comes some coaching pressures. 
Yeah, Scott's up to that task. There's, there's no question about that. His time in Montreal, his time in Toronto, being with Jacksonville in, in the uh, uh, NFL, mm -hmm. you know, he, he understands the pressure of the game and he understands the pressure of the fans. When you go back to uh, where I came in in 1985, we were at probably the lowest ebb uh, of football uh, in a long period of time for the CFL. Uh, fan base was around 16,000 people, and, and uh, I think that was pumped up. And, you know, when we went to Ivor Wynn, uh, you could count the p uh, fans in the stands. But they were passionate fans, and they've always remained passionate fans. And to answer your question, they will demand uh, that you win. Now, every practice, uh, every draft choice, uh, every game is in preparation for one game. And that one game is the Grey Cup game. So you, you schedule everything and you work everything in a, in a fashion that it brings you right to that game. And so fans, you know, need to be cognizant of the fact you don't win every game in the CFL. Mm -hmm. What you have to do is win enough games to put you in that last game of the year. Let's talk tie cats a little bit later. I need to know a little bit, and I think people want to know a little bit about Coach John Salavandis before the coach. A player at Ottawa University in Kansas? I, I didn't know any. I, I, I'll be honest with you. When I first got to know you, I saw Ottawa. I thought you just became a coach at Ottawa U. And it was not the case. No, I, I, Ottawa University in Kansas is a small Baptist school, mm -hmm. uh, and we played in a 11-team uh, league. And uh, very proud to say that in, in the five years I was there, because I was redshirted the first year, uh, in the five years that I was there, we lost four ball games. So it was a, uh, a, a really great experience for me because the coaches that I had and uh, Coach Peters, Dick Peters was the head coach at that time uh, and had been in the, uh, the NCAA, et cetera, after coming out of, of uh, Kansas State as a great player. And he was a, a, a teaching coach and he taught me so many things and, and he uh, inspired me to do things uh, on the field uh, that I didn't think I was capable of doing. Mm -hmm. And as a captain of the team, et cetera, uh, we were so proud that, that we could uh, compete and compete at that level. But at the same time, I was learning, and I didn't know it at the time, mm -hmm. but I was learning what it took to be a coach. And, and uh, I always appreciated the fact that, that Coach Peters was always there for me. Was that, was that your inspiration to, to, to continue playing, at least, at least coaching, at least staying in football and becoming a coach? Absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, we had a, a course uh, in football. And, and we actually, in the off season, uh, we padded up and went outside. But it wasn't uh, to practice. It was there to learn how to coach certain elements of the ball game. Mm -hmm. and, and then we went through a process where we had to go out and scout another team and bring that scouting report back and, and present that scouting report uh, to our fellow uh, classmates. Mm -hmm. And so through all of that, I, w I was beginning to understand that that might be a calling that I, that I could get into and enjoy. And, and Bubba, you know, as long as I coached, I never worked a day. <laughs> you know, it was just fun for me. And the guys that I had uh, through the uh, early years that I was here in the CFL, I started with uh, Saskatchewan as a guest coach in 83. And then uh, Monty Charles was here. It was a friend of mine and helped me get to know Al Bruno. And Al Bruno hired me. And we went through that period of time uh, where I was learning the CFL game. It was all new. It was all different to me. Uh, and I had a lot of help along the way, and, and a lot of it came from our players. Well, and because you had built up a, a sweet resume, as we showed earlier there, about your days as a coach in the NCAA level, we'll call it the U.S. college system, before you came to Canada and learning the four-down game, and again, learning as you were as a head coach at some point as well. But before the, you went to the CFL, there was a stop with the team that I think a lot of people have forgotten, and that is the Montreal machine. 
What was that experience like? The Montreal machine. La machine. Yes. <laughs> uh, that was a year, you know, 89, we went to the Grey Cup and we lost that Grey Cup game to Saskatchewan. The very next year, Al Bruno got fired. And at the end of that season, uh, I was let go as a coach, fired, if you will. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, the machine presented itself as an opportunity mm -hmm. uh, to go with the NFL team and we were uh, we were in Orlando Florida for the month of February mm -hmm. we opened our uh, season uh, in uh, Alabama mm -hmm. we had never been in the O as a team it had never been in Montreal wow yet the team was formed in Orlando Florida mm -hmm. played its first ball game in Alabama and then came to the big O uh, to open our season, and I think we opened with 56,000 people Wow! in the stadium at that time. And, and I was just about to say, I mean, that league, it, I mean, I have faint memories of it. I do remember it, but and it didn't really last very long, but wasn't it seen as sort of a, a building block, a minor league system, if I could call it that, to get to that next, le next level in the National Football League? Absolutely, and the, the National Football League funded it. Oh, okay. The National Football League was uh, the primary. There was a practice team that was set up in uh, Dallas, Texas, mm -hmm. that practiced. And so if you had an injury on your ball club and you needed a tight end, you called Dallas, mm -hmm. and Dallas forwarded a person uh, to your team. Uh, we played around. We played in London. Uh, we played in Frankfurt, Germany. We played in Spain. Uh, we played in Florida. Uh, we played in Texas. You know, the Texas group was, was really an interesting group because we flew from Montreal and they put us on two separate airplanes as a team. What? <laughs> one, went to, one went to Philadelphia uh, first and the other one went to Boston. And then they met again in Dallas. And from Dallas, we, were, uh, we moved on down to the Alodome mm -hmm. uh, in San Antonio. <laughs> so, you know, things were... were uh, were different and fun. It was really an enjoyable time. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, we didn't fare well as, as a football team. Uh, and uh, I was out of that the very next year. Was Farragelli there? Yeah, Joe Farragelli, uh, Don Southern, wow. and myself from the uh, wow. CFL. Uh, <laughs> Joe was the offensive coordinator. I was the line coach. Don Southern was the D uh, coordinator and D line coach amazing and where the travels would go and you see that with assistant coaches to this day there were the where you trace that traveling of where you end up it's amazing to me so your journey all of a sudden brings you to the tiger cats how did that begin it's a it's a long story that i can uh, cut down and make very short i was the oc uh, at missouri southern state uh, college in uh, joplin missouri there was a fellow that kept sitting in the stands every day, and our head coach got nervous that he was spying on our team during practices. So he asked me to go talk to him, and I went and talked to him. Turned out the guy was Monty Charles. Monty Charles had been in the CFL. He'd been a, a successful head coach in Wisconsin and was actually in that area uh, because uh, he had contracted leukemia, and basically uh, he couldn't work. And uh, Monty and I became friends, and I asked him if he would like to come down and help me on the offensive side. And he did. And uh, we worked together for a year, uh, two years, actually, in Joplin. And uh, then Monty uh, got a chance to go back to Saskatchewan uh, as a coach because he healed up from the leukemia. Uh, he went back to Saskatchewan. From Saskatchewan, he went to Hamilton, uh, and was was here as uh, personnel and he called me on the phone one day and i was uh, at that time i was in garden city kansas as a coach and he called me and he said uh, stick by your phone al bruno is going to call you and offer you a job and sure enough al got on the phone and he said i'd like you to come up here and visit mm -hmm. i flew up here to uh, canada and spent a week in the uh, hotel mm -hmm. uh, with al talking every day about football went back to uh, my uh, duties in, in Garden City, and Al called me in April, and as of April 15th this year, uh, being offered that job, 
uh, 39 years ago. Wow. And uh, I said, absolutely, I'd come up there and work, and, and that's how it all came about. And Hamilton trapped you. Yeah. <laughs> you got yeah. trapped in Hamilton from there. No, so the you had some special years with that team. I know when we think Grey Cup here, because it's been so long, we just talked about the 25-year drought, I think automatic thoughts go to the 1999 club. Uh, which were magical, the Fluties, the McManus, we can go on and on, Joe Montford. But there was a 1986 team that was real special, weren't they? Oh, they were. They were special. You know, I came in 85, and in 85, we started out 1-6 and six that season. And I thought to myself, hmm, this might not be a, a long stay. <laughs> but we turned it around. We went 7-2. and two. Uh, in the second part of that season, got ourselves into the Grey Cup, uh, went to Montreal and played uh, BC and lost that ball game. But we vowed after that game that we'd be back. And uh, our, our team put itself together the next year in 86. We started out a little slow, but we picked up the pace on, on that season. And uh, we had a quarterback named Kenny Hobart. Kenny Hobart was... Uh, uh, was a quarterback out of Idaho uh, that was a, uh, a linebacker, fullback, quarterback who could run with the football. And so we developed our, our offense around Kenny. He ended up with uh, 982 yards rushing as a quarterback wow. while he was second in the league in touchdown passes in 85. In 86, we start out, as I said, a little slow. Kenny gets hurt, and we turn to Mike Kerrigan. Now we have to change our entire offense because Kerrigan's a drop back quarterback where Kenny was a rollout, a sprint out type quarterback. We changed our offense in, in about the fourth ball game, fifth ball game, and uh, went to a drop back game. And uh, Mike Kerrigan carried us through uh, that year right to the end. And that had to be a real adjustment because you're the offensive line coach. And the offensive line, you just talked about a guy that's a sprinter, a runner, a guy that likes to roll out to this dropback style, kind of NFL style quarterback. I think he did play with the Patriots a little bit. He did. Um, how tough was that for the offensive line? You, you must have had some good guys there. We, we did, and, and credit Joe Zuger and Al Bruno for that because they, they brought in guys. We brought in Miles Gurrell in 85, uh, eight-year veteran at that time. Uh, they had let him go in Montreal. We brought him in here. Uh, unfortunately, in the first ball game he was in, we had him going downfield on a kickoff. He broke his arm. Ouch. So he was out for that game. We traded for Johnny Malinowski, who was, a I think at that time, was a nine-year veteran of the league from Toronto uh, as a tackle. Uh, we inserted in, in our offensive line, we had uh, or inherited uh, uh, Marv Alamang, who was playing tackle, and we inherited uh, Jason Riley, who was playing tackle. Uh, I moved both of those guys from tackle, put uh, Marv Alamang at the center and put Jason at the guard. Uh, we had Mike Dirks, who had come to us from Edmonton, was a draft choice. Uh, we had Dale Sanderson come in. We had Ralph Schultz here. So we molded that group. And as you say, we in the sprint out game, we were turn back protection, and it was completely different mm -hmm. from what it had to be with Mike Kerrigan. But those veterans, uh, Alamang and Riley, and, and again, uh, Johnny Malinowski on the outside were able to adjust and work the rookie guys into that. And, and we, uh, we ended up that year uh, basically uh, with the least number of sacks in the league mm -hmm. and the most number of dropbacks Good in the like league. That. So you win. Yeah. How, how, how awesome was winning? Oh, you know, it's everything. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody talks about uh, the fun part of the game. The fun part is winning. And you have to take your lumps along the way, mm -hmm. but you also have to keep a very positive attitude uh, of what's happening, you know, how, how it's going to unfold. And uh, when we had to go in 86 and play Toronto in that two-game uh, total point uh, series and went into Toronto basically way down in, in uh, points and to come away with that win, we knew we were going to win the Grey Cup. Were, 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 you, were you inspired by the, the words of Leo Cahill? <laughs> <laughs> well, Leo Cahill is a different story. But, <laughs> but uh, Bob Obilovich was, was the, uh, 
was the guy that at that time, and of course we've, we've known Bob for so many years after mm -hmm. that, uh, Bob was devastated mm -hmm. that, that uh, he lost that ball game. Mm -hmm. But it, it turned around uh, on our uh, defensive side. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and a great story that came out of that game, we always dressed only six offensive linemen. Pat Brady, our long snapper, mm -hmm. was, was our sixth uh, offensive lineman. And in the pregame warm-up, John Malinowski got hurt. Don't ask me how. He got hurt. <laughs> he, he had a, a tear in his right knee. So he's out of the ball game. And we asked to put another player in to replace him. And uh, Bob Obilovich said no. Uh, under the league rules, uh, within the first hour of the ball game, you couldn't make any more changes. And so we, we went into the ball game with six uh, uh, offensive linemen ended up starting the ball game with five wow. offensive linemen and had to survive that game and survive we did and, and win we did. Well, that's an outstanding story, Coach, you know, and your journey would continue and then there's a stop with Ottawa, the Rough Riders, um, and then maybe there's a little football purgatory there, but then a call, a call comes from the little general. Uh, yeah. There, were, there was a period of time when Ronnie Lancaster had to take over. I think that's what you're referring to mm -hmm. in 206. Yep. Had to take over for uh, a fired coaching staff. And Ronnie asked me if I would come back and, and uh, help him through the 206 season. Mm -hmm. And oddly enough, Jason Moss was our quarterback that time. This year's Grey Cup champion from Montreal mm -hmm. was our quarterback. And he's the head coach at, in Montreal. But... Uh, uh, we we spent the latter part of that season together, mm -hmm. uh, Ronnie and I did, and of course that was always a thrill. Ronnie always spent time with us during the 80s mm -hmm. in our training camp at Brock University. Mm -hmm. He was there almost every day because he wanted to be around football, and and so were his his two young boys mm -hmm. uh, at that time. So yeah, there was a good offensive mind. It was at uh, Ronnie Jr. Ronnie Jr. Ronnie Jr. was a good was a good offensive coordinator. I think for the Tie Cats for a time. Yeah, and Bobby uh, went down to the States and coached uh, Bobby, uh, uh, the younger son, mm -hmm. went down to the States and coached down there for a long period of time. As so many football players do, as so many coaches do, as we see right now, there's the move to the broadcast booth. <laughs> and I'll tell you, what was, I mean, did you feel nervous? Was this something that you said, okay, you know what, I know a lot about this game. I've had experiences. I've won great cup. Like, to translate all that information Sometimes it's very difficult for coaches and players to go to the booth, whether it be radio or television. And radio is probably a little more difficult because you kind of have to describe more. Was that a challenge for you? It, you know, it's very interesting because I, when I went uh, with uh, CHML uh, to call the games, uh, the first game I called Bob Bertina was, was the play-by-play uh, uh, -play guy. And I came into the booth and I must have had about 10 sheets of paper <laughs> in front of me and Bob looked at me and, and kind of said you don't need that stuff and gathered it up and kind of shuffled it off to the side and said just do whatever you you feel you see in the ball game and and I credit Bob so much for the fact that I was able to relax and, and go through that process with him uh, they did they did stumble me into a, a situation one time where at the halftime of a they had uh, uh, Vince Mazza and Ralph Sazio as the guests. Mm -hmm. And Bertina and Hooper disappeared <laughs> and left me there with those two guys <laughs> to run a halftime show. <laughs> now, I'm going to tell you, you talk about being nervous and being scared. <laughs> I didn't understand what was going on. And Vince Mazza took over the mic, and, and of course, it all went off well, and the guys had a big chuckle of it. Well, you know, it's it, people don't recognize, they call it the A chair, the B chair in some cases, someone who's guiding the broadcast, and then there's someone who's like the analyst, like very much when I'm with the Ticats Audio Network, it's, it, I'm sort of the, 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 the host, if you want to call it that, and then Andy Fantuz is the guy who's the expert, the knowledge, and I throw questions to him, but yeah, the role reversal can be sometimes very, very difficult. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> it is, and it was, <laughs> but it was a lesson well learned, and then we had a lot of fun with it, and those two guys, of course, uh, we're, we're great CFL uh, legends. 
I'm going to ask our, our director, Mike Corson, to bring up a, a sheet here about some of the people that you've worked with in the broadcast booth. And I, I mean, look at these names, Bratina McAuliffe, Ricky Zamperin, Andy Mack for a year, uh, uh, of course, uh, Marshall Ferguson. And I've been fortunate and lucky enough to know all of these people here. And they all call the game a little bit differently. For you as an analyst, how was it? I mean, each one of these guys have, has their own individual skills and, and greatness. But how did you fit into all those different? They're all so different. They are different. And, and uh, again, I go back to the fact that with Bob Bratina, I, I had learned what I was supposed to do. And so when when we went with uh, Tim McAuliffe, who, who was a great uh, host of, of uh, TV shows, et cetera, it was a little bit different. And one of the things that I had to learn with Tim was Tim would start a sentence and pause. And when he paused, I thought that was my turn to come in. Mm -hmm. And so I would step on him uh, a few times mm -hmm. during the broadcast. And we finally worked that out to where I understood what he was doing. Mm -hmm. uh, when we moved on with Rick Zamper and Rick, Rick and I worked, what, uh, nine years, I believe it was, uh, together in the booth. And, and Rick was just absolutely perfect uh, for me because he, he had uh, the right attitude towards the play-by-play -play guy, mm -hmm. set it up for the analysts, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and, and then from there, of course, we went to Marshall Ferguson, mm -hmm. who, who's just a ball of fire, and Marshall wanted to talk, 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 talk. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, I found with Marshall that I had to almost kind of slow him down a little bit and let, let things uh, he's, he's, develop. He's loaded with information. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and, and rightfully so. He, he's an intelligent and, and doing a great job right now uh, with TSN. So all of them were different. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, we seem to be able to work it all out. And, and in the end result, uh, we thought we did a pretty good job with all of them. Well, I can stay from my standpoint here in the couple of years that I've, you know, been fortunate enough to to be on the pre and post game show with with the Ty Cats Audio Network. Like your, I've said it to you, and I, I'm not, I'll say it to you, your face. I've said it to you when we were on on radio uh, times when you where I were I when we were at uh, Tim Hortons Field and you are present with us. Like our our segments are, I think they're legendary. Like they're like I mean I can present to you different situations when times are good with the Tiger Cats and times are bad and you're even keeled and you just deliver the goods, uh, and whether it be a stressful situation for the team or not. I, I think that's important uh, for people that do the job that I was doing and, and continue to do. Uh, you can't get too high and you can't get too low. You, you've got to be uh, fair with the players. You've got to be fair with the coaches, but you also have to tell the truth. You, you can't allow yourself to get into a situation where you uh, skim over things. You've got to tell it like it is because that's what the fans want. Mm -hmm. That's what the fans come there to uh, listen to or, or watch, mm -hmm. uh, and they want to hear it from somebody. Okay, let's talk about these tie cats now. <laughs> Again, I keep saying it, but I can't help it. It amazes me. You've been around this league for so long. It's a 19 league. The 25 years since the Tiger Cats have won a great cup. Like, if you do the physics and the mathematics, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> like, the, the team should have won at least one in a 9- or 10-team league at some point. But it just hasn't happened. I know each year, and you're right, and I know Coach O used to say it, every year, every team is different. Why, have, why haven't they won? They got there. Uh, several times, uh, but they weren't able to uh, capitalize on it and, and come away with a win. I think it shows you how difficult it is. You know, uh, when when we went in 85, in 86, I thought, well, this is, this is good. You, you, we do this all the time. Well, uh, 87, 88, uh, we showed that we couldn't uh, do the job. Uh, and then came back in 89 and got the job done. And then the team went through the 90s where, where things were really bad mm -hmm. for a long period of time. Uh, and uh, then when Ronnie Lancaster came in and, and brought in the quarterback and, and the receiver uh, from Edmonton that, that was necessary to, to make things work, uh, you know, they, they get into the Grey Cup <coughs> in 98, mm -hmm. but they have to come back in 99 to win it. Mm -hmm. So it is very difficult to get there. I think about the years with Kent. Uh, Kent, Kent, two, two sniffs at it as well, too. Coach O, 
two sniffs at it as well, too. And that, you know, what's killing me. It, it'll kill me. That 15 and three team, I, I, I like they were, I mean, you saw, they, they were amazing. Like everything, every screw turned. An injury drop. Someone stepped up. Down goes Masolo. Here, here comes Evans. Like everything worked, but it just goes to show you, as that one movie says, on any given day in this sport, anything can happen. Absolutely, and and, uh, and you have to take that attitude mm -hmm. into your play, and yet you, you can't win them all, mm -hmm. but you've got to win the one at the end uh, that makes the difference uh, in your season, basically. It, it, it's it, it's it's so tough. So here we go again. We're rolling up for a season. We're only about really 80, 75 days away from training camp. And we'll be down there at McMaster University. We'll look, you know, keep in a look at this team. You know, the, I think there was a lot of talk at the end of the season. What would happen at quarterback? Well, they've committed to Bo Levi Mitchell. Do you believe that was the right move? Yes. Uh, you know, uh, at the time uh, when Bo was hurt uh, during that season, I had my doubts as to whether or not he could bounce back being in the age he's in. But uh, age is also a benefactor, uh, a benefit uh, to a player because he's, he understands what it takes to get back uh, into playing shape, et cetera. Uh, I think uh, keeping Powell uh, is, is something that has to happen uh, for this club, and they may bring in other quarterback uh, <coughs> challengers mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. But uh, – I think Milanovic looked at Bo, saw his arm strength as as back to what he thought it should be, uh, saw his experience as a quarterback, and said, you know, this is the guy we, we need to start with and, and uh, go to training camp with him as number one. And, and if somebody beats him out, uh, okay. But other than that, uh, Bo Levi Mitchell will be the quarterback. The organization committed to bringing back several key parts, and this is your specialty, parts of that offensive line, and I think some of those names needed to be there. Yeah, Wood Manzi, Revenberg, Beard, those guys needed to be there. That, that, that's your uh, core inside group uh, that, that has to be there. Uh, it remains to be seen whether the tackles can live up to uh, what they need to uh, to be good because if your tackles are not – uh, absolutely good uh, on the outside, your passing game is going to suffer. And remember, we're looking at a quarterback that's a drop back quarterback. Because Figueroa came in with a lot of, you know, a lot of hype and he graded so well in his years with BC. And it's just been injury after injury for him. And, and you just hope that he can get back to what we expected him to be. Joel Figueroa, when he first came into the Ticat organization, was let go because of injuries. And then he overcame those injuries in BC, came back to Hamilton, and ended up being injured again. So you're right. You know, uh, you you count your offensive linemen. You talk about uh, man hours. How many plays in every game can they stay? If you can keep your offensive line on the field without injury uh, for long periods of time, they will get better as a unit. It, it's when something happens, and, and we're not talking about owies, because owies in the offensive line, uh, the bone has to be coming through the skin before you, you take them out of the ball game. Mm -hmm. and, and so the fact that uh, uh, you've got a lot of personnel there, you've got to mold them into a unit, then that unit has to stay on the field mm -hmm. and has to put in the man hours. There's a belief in football that the running back position has become extinct. That was not the case last year as the I thought James Butler really emerged as, as someone that was really key to that offense. I think you have to commit to a run game. When you say that the run game is no longer uh, you know, viable, et cetera, every team that went to the Grey Cup in the number of years that I was here had a running game. And the running game was important to him. And Butler uh, last year showed that he can do that. Now, Milanovic also signed a tight end this year from the uh, school LSU, uh, Thaddeus Moss. Moss is a tight end per se who can also go downfield mm -hmm. uh, as a receiver. But he's a blocker. In the past years, what they've had to do is use an offensive lineman that is a tight end when you wanted to be in the run game. Mm -hmm. Well, that takes one of the pass receivers out of the ball mm -hmm. game 
uh, and, and so the defense can adjust to you. You bring in a, a guy like a Thaddeus Moss and play him as a tight end, they've got to respect him as a receiver. So they can't key in on that run game. And the run game, to me, is always where you're, you have to start. And, and th it brings up a great point. You know, in the early days of the CFL, practice was full pad, full go. And so the run game, you know, you actually saw the run game develop mm -hmm. because it, people were, were knocking each other around. Now, without the pads on, a lot of times you get fooled if you don't, you're don't. you not very astute as a coach. You get fooled into thinking you got a run game when actually you don't. Can I ask you that? Because, you know, you, you got a little old school in you. Like, this whole thing, because football to me is a contact sport, and I understand that there are safety measures that have to be taken, but I feel like there are some parts of football that just aren't as good as they used to be. And that's number one is on defense is tackling. And I'm wondering if the practices without being in, pad, in, in full, full uniform, if that's affected that, that specialty of the game. I think you're right, Bubba. You know, tackling is such a great part of the game and, and has to be. Uh, you know, they've tried to come up with all kinds of devices to teach tackling. Well, tackling is the want to in, uh, you know, technique, yes. But the want to is, is really there. And when you practice uh, now, what happens is as you come up for the tackle, you're told to bump off. You, you don't tackle. You don't take the man down. Mm -hmm. Now, that that uh, part of the ball game has suffered, uh, I think, because of that. Mm -hmm. Let's talk defense here a little bit here, and I can't not ask you this question. Uh, there is a legend, <laughs> we can call him. Uh, he's become, in his own mind and in this community and in the CFL, no Simone Lawrence. Did you see that coming? No. Uh, Simone still... Uh, an athlete, a uh, freak athlete, uh, to be sure, who has the ability to continue to play. But at the same time, I'm proud of him for understanding that there's always a time to get out uh, while you're still healthy and while you still have a future uh, to go to. Uh, and the Ticata organization bringing him as an ambassador in Hamilton is a great move uh, on their part. Simone Lawrence is really, he was one of the most outstanding players I've seen in all the years uh, that I've been up here because he could do so many things and he did so many things. Uh, and, you know, we always laughed about the fact that uh, he could talk to his opponents and, and get away with it. And some of the things he said probably, uh, if it were Vegas, would stay in Vegas. <laughs> He's a special kind of guy, and you're right. It'll be interesting to see him uh, in football and on a different side. Do you like what they did on defense? They've certainly got some guys from the Argonauts that can pass, that can rush the passer, pardon me, uh, and arguably with Peters, maybe the best cornerback in the league. I, I think rating the uh, Toronto Argonauts for players is something I admire <laughs> and really enjoy. But at the same time, when you look at it, if, if you're a player in Toronto and Toronto gives a million dollars to their quarterback, how much money is there to spread around to these other players who definitely deserve it? And so they look at it and they say, well, you know, if I'm going to get a small raise, et cetera, and I'm staying here in a lesser facility, in a bigger community uh, with all kinds of, of issues and travel, et cetera, and I look at Hamilton and I see that beautiful Tim Hortons Field in that great facility that's there and I can make a few more bucks down there and they want me, why wouldn't I go? And so I think uh, Barlow and Kendricks and, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, Peters, et cetera, uh, made the right decision to come to Hamilton and certainly help uh, Hamilton. And if you can rush four guys, Bubba, and, and get to the quarterback and play cover on the back end, that's so much better than having to blitz all the time in order to get pressure. And and w even though you got, had some wonderful guys playing on that D-line last year and even the year prior, that was an issue. I mean, guys would get there, and I know Coach O and many other coaches say, sometimes it's not about the sack. Sometimes it's about just getting there. 
but they weren't getting there. And I thought sometimes that might have exposed that linebacking and, and secondary at times. It did. It, it absolutely did. And I think that's why they made some of the adjustments they did uh, in, in the uh, defensive group for this year, uh, including coaches. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, obviously uh, the, the game is a drop back game. Uh, in CFL in the passing game and so you have to have pass rushers mm -hmm. and, and so you know it, it's kind of uh, okay so you've got great pass rushers but they've got to be able to disrupt that quarterback they've got to be able to get there you can't always have your uh, will linebacker Simone Lawrence having to blitz in order to get to the quarterback you've, you've got to be able to do it with four people and, and I think uh, we had good people but like you said, we weren't getting the job done completely. We were getting halfway there, right. and halfway doesn't make it. Two last questions here. One simple: Will the streak end this year? Will the will will the streak end this year? Will it? Will there be a Grey Cup in Hamilton in 2024? If if I could predict the Grey Cup, you know, uh, I wouldn't have to be here talking to you. I could, I, I could be out making money someplace. No, uh, I, you know, I I I don't want to dismiss it. I want to just say that it's the goal. Mm -hmm. It's it's like I said before. Uh, every draft choice, every practice, every game points to one thing, mm -hmm. and that's the last game of the year. You're getting real good at this media thing. <laughs> How you know Beamsville? Beams of it is. You know, how many years have you been I mean, since you've come from the United States? Uh, I came here in April 15th, 1985, and have never left. And even, we even when I worked in Ottawa, even when I worked in Montreal, we made our home right here in the Hamilton area. Well, you're a mainstay of this community, and we are so appreciative and lucky to have you here as all the stuff that you did in the years as coaching. Uh, the stuff that you've done in the media as an analyst, what you continue to do uh, for the, with the Thai Cats Audio Network with your contributions and uh, from someone like myself that watched you from afar and has had the pleasure to work with you. Uh, it's been amazing. Thank you. And uh, looking forward to many times and you coming right back on this couch to talk. So talk about a great cop, maybe. We'll yeah, do that. well, Bubba, thank you so much. And it's easy to talk with you mm -hmm. and, and all the guys that, that you mentioned uh, earlier in the year uh, on this broadcast. So thank you again for having me. It's great to have you there, Coach. That's your Sports Line podcast for the day. And as you've just seen and heard, we love talking sports, especially if it's local. If you do know of an athlete, team, or event to promote, the Sports Line podcast, do want to hear from you. Please hit the thumbs up, like, and subscribe button. And if you do have something to say, please do. For the wonderful people that make the Sports Line podcast possible, thank you so very much. And we'll see you tomorrow.